I decided I would actually bring with me, I travel light, but I would decide that I'd bring with me my, my copies of volumes one and two of The Secret Doctrine. As you can see, they've been well read and gone over. I don't put these little tabs on things just because they look pretty. I put them because this book, uh, for me, as I'm sure for many of you in this room, is an ever-growing catalog of ideas. And it changes as you change. And there are new folds and wrinkles and insights that you find in the book as the years go by. And I tend to travel very light going through this life. People ask me what style my apartment is decorated in, and I respond, Thoreau. I really have a very spare existence, but there are a handful of objects and books that I always keep, and The Secret Doctrine is among them. One of the things I want to say in beginning this lecture is something that's directed not so much to folks in this room, because many of you have been reading The Secret Doctrine for many years, as I have, but maybe for friends of ours who are curious about theosophy, curious about the life and career of Madame Blavatsky, and that is, I feel strongly that it's very important to read books like this one, to read these ur-texts of contemporary mystical and alternative spiritual culture. They're not so far away that they can't be experienced by the individual. There's all kinds of speculation as to what is to be found in these magisterial books like The Secret Doctrine or, for example, G.I. Gurdjieff's magnum opus, Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson. And our culture has become too attenuated to reading the coverage of things rather than to reading the things themselves. Our generation certainly didn't create that intellectual habit, but we seem to have perfected it. And people will pick through volumes by Blavatsky or Eliphas Levy or Gurdjieff or others, and they will think they've seized upon some point, and they might feel very roused and very worked up about whatever point they feel they've seized upon, but it's almost impossible to understand anything in these great books without understanding it in context. It has to be one part of a whole. That's certainly how Madame Blavatsky saw it. And she wasn't making an effort, nor I believe were any of the writers who I've mentioned, making an effort to deter the reader. These books absolutely are readable. And I often tell young people that if you can go like that, you can read them. And I encourage, I very deeply encourage engagement with these books. And the individual who approaches an epic work like The Secret Doctrine and who reads it rather than reads about it will be filled with a sense of nobility and appropriate accomplishment. Whether or not everything in the book touches the heart or the intellect of each individual reader is almost beside the point. But it's an act of really engaging with a body of ideas that have been hugely influential on our contemporary culture, but that, again, go read by only a very, very slender fraction of the people who have heard of these books or who talk about these books online or on late night radio or something of that nature. We're always looking for ways to build a sense of healthful, reasonable self-respect, a sense of nobility, a sense of just and deserved authority. And one way it can be done is by refusing to live in translation, so to speak, but saying, I'm going to delve into this and I'm going to go all the way and I'll see who I am when I come out. And that answer will be different for all of us. One of the things I was always struck by in The Secret Doctrine was the incredible prescience with which Madame Blavatsky wrote about America. America as a nation is mentioned very, very few times over the course of these two volumes. However, what HPB alludes about America was so foresightful and so remarkable that it genuinely gives the sensitive reader
pause. When she talks about the Book of Zan appearing before her, when she talks about receiving communications, whether the Mahatma letters or other communiques that go beyond what we regard as ordinary gathering of information, there's a certain credence that gets lent to that when one realizes how foresightful HPB was in 1888 in foreseeing certain changes in America that really wouldn't begin to even unfold for a few generations until after her death. Most specifically, she alludes to America and particularly to the southern coast of America as the south, rather to say the southwestern coast of America, Southern California, as being a kind of place, a womb, a place of gestation, a place where we would begin to see the earliest stirrings in kernel form of a cosmic leap, an evolutionary leap on the greatest scale. That is to say, the development of the beginnings, the earliest stirrings of a sixth sub-race within the cosmological scheme of root races, we being currently in that cosmological scheme, the fifth sub-race of the fifth root race, and as HPB saw it, within the next few centuries, if you're not patient, the secret doctrine is not for you, within the, <laughs> within the next few centuries, we would begin to see the germination, <clears throat> as she alludes, on the west coast, the southwest coast of America, of the development of a sixth sub-race, and that this sixth sub-race would be indicated, would be marked by a greater degree of intuition, sensitivity, and possession of what we might call a sixth, a sixth sense extra abilities that went beyond the five sensory. And it's really just fascinating because she was writing all of this at a time, I mean, look, it was really just, gosh, about two decades after the end of the Civil War. America, as we know it today, was only just taking shape. And she was writing this right at the beginning of what was to become a century of really substantial research into ESP, telepathy, psychical abilities on an academic scale that the world hadn't seen before. And there's a great deal more that can be said about that and the manner in which that has continued into our own time. This research is under constant criticism. It's under constant challenge to find funding. It has been I think wrongly hounded off of a number of college campuses, not all of them, and it continues today always struggling to define itself, parapsychology always struggles to define itself as a legitimate field of clinical study. And yet, on its most serious footing, practiced by people like my friend Dean Radin at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, in Northern California, or Daryl Bem at Cornell, or my friends at the Ryan Center for Research in Durham, North Carolina. On its most solid intellectual footing, this research has withstood, and the data it's produced has withstood, greater criticism than probably any other field of research, whether in the social sciences, in psychology, in psychopharmacology, and the data that has been produced by this field at its absolute best has never been overturned, has never been overturned. And I write about this in my books, One Simple Idea and The Miracle Club. And it's extraordinary that clinical science with very little reference uh, to Madame Blavatsky has produced a body of data, controversial though it may be, that speaks to the existence, that speaks to the measurability, statistically 
and otherwise of sensory abilities that go beyond those five that we're familiar with. And that was one of the things HPB said would be an indicator, an indicator of the earliest germination of a sixth root race. Now, she never came right out and said, all this is going to begin to percolate on the coast of Southern California. She made indications that were later developed by Annie Besant, who felt stronger and was more pronounced in her assertion that this is where humanity's next germination would begin to occur. But the very fact that Madame Blavatsky made these observations as early as 1888 is extraordinary. I mean, as those of you who are from California know, at that time, California was ranches, newly laid railroad tracts, oil fields. The gold rush had, had begun to ebb. It was nothing like the economic and cultural and spiritual engine that we know it as today. It was wide open spaces with some mission houses, again, ranching, agriculture, orange groves. The movie industry was unheard of. The economic boom that lifted California really didn't occur until the age of World War I. The migration of the movie business there really didn't start to occur until the 19, late 19 teens, early 1920s, when the silent film industry began to grow. There were very few voices, literary, spiritual, cultural, even political, coming out of California at that time. It was America's orange grove, you know, to a great extent. And yet she had this insight, this remarkable, remarkable insight that California and the surrounding environs would become this tremendous engine of spiritual progress. She writes in volume two, it, it, it is in America that the transformation will take place and has already begun silently occurring. Those are remarkable lines to have written in 1888. That is a remarkable piece of foresight that I haven't found in any other literature of that time. HPB had, throughout her entire career, a very deep affection for and attachment to America. She lived in America for only a relatively short time in the early to late mid 1870s. But those years, in some regards, were perhaps the most consequential of her career because they served to crystallize her outlook. And when she came to America for the first time in the early 1870s, she said, first of all, she was attracted to the United States because she saw it as the cradle of spiritualism. But she also made the observation, you cannot live in the cradle forever. So she was, she was a sympathetic critic of spiritualism, but nonetheless, she wanted to visit the land where she saw this spiritual revolution bubbling up. And again, her insight was very, very correct. Certainly, the idea of channeling and mediumship and seances and so forth, going under different vocabulary terms, had a much longer and deeper and greater history. But it was in America where these things got formulated into modern movements, movements with clubs and newsletters and churches and societies. And as people in the U.S. began to organize into seance circles in the early 1850s with instructions from a man who HPB references once in The Secret Doctrine, Andrew Jackson Davis, a young man who was a medium from Poughkeepsie, New York, in the Hudson Valley. They used to call him the Poughkeepsie Seer. This was intended to make fun of him, but he actually liked the label and he began to use it himself. 
And Henry Alcott also recorded an instance of traveling up to Poughkeepsie to visit Andrew Jackson Davis in about 1845. They were both still very young men, both probably around age 19 at that point. And Davis was a remarkable American figure because he would report the ability to enter into what was then called a mesmeric trance. And he would go into these trance states and he would come out and he would dictate these vast metaphysical lectures by which people were tremendously excited and aroused. Davis did many, many extraordinary things in his life and he was a remarkable figure. I do have to share this one footnote. It was noted that the same year that he began to produce his lectures was also the same year that the first popular English translations appeared of the work of Emanuel Swedenborg and some critics noted a suspicious congruency between Andrew's lectures and Swedenborg's and Andrew said well that's because he's my tutor on the spirit plane so you can, you can take that as you will but Davis did do many great things and one of the reasons why Americans including Henry Olcott and later Madame Blavatsky and Madame Blavatsky can be called an American because when she left for India she was an American citizen and she remained an American citizen her entire life and she was very proud of that. I'll say more about that. But one of the reasons that figures like Henry Olcott and Madame Blavatsky and many many other folk, many many other folk were attracted to Andrew was not only because of the content of his metaphysical lectures but because his his psychical abilities, depending on your point of view, and his emergence as a national figure aroused a hope in many modern people in the West that the age of prophecy was not something that just belonged to the distant past, that we were still capable of receiving messages from beyond the veil, so to speak within the modern world. And the fact that Andrew was nicknamed the Poughkeepsie Seer made him all the more an appealing figure to Americans. And he intuitively sensed that by claiming that nickname. Again, it was meant to be an epithet. It was meant to be something insulting. Like who is this kid from the backwaters of Poughkeepsie who thinks he's speaking with the voice of a prophet? But what Andrew grasped intuitively, and I ask you to listen to this very, very carefully, what he grasped intuitively was that the very quality that some journalists and academics saw in him as fodder for ridicule was the same thing that made him appealing to vast numbers of people, which was the idea that the prophet could come from very, very ordinary circumstances. So the fact that his backstory involved growing up as a poor farm kid, becoming a cobbler's apprentice at age 17, being seen as this kind of upstate New York bearded yokel, and he was no yokel. He understood, he understood in ways that his critics did not, that that very ordinariness was hugely appealing to Americans because it tapped an instinct in people that maybe within this new land, maybe within this new Israel, as some people put it, there could be a new dispensation from God, from the beyond. Certainly Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, felt that way. Certainly Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of the Christian Science Movement, felt that way. Certainly lots of spirit mediums who were inspired by Andrew's example felt that way. There was something about Andrew and the other figures of that day in their very ordinariness that drew Americans to them at least as much as the metaphysical messages that were coming from them.